Um, so we started out with the pre-planning uh, phase of the audit, which involves uh, looking at the client industry, assessing the, their operational objectives, strategy, um, and what kind of accounting information, so what kind of transactions do they engage in? Do they have complex transactions? Uh, are there a lot of subjective transactions? So this was overall just trying to gather an understanding of the client environment, right? That was chapter three, understanding the entity. And the importance of that is to assess where the client's business risk is. And we assess that business risk because we're trying to determine how might those risks manifest in the financial statements. Right, so if you have a client with very uh, complex transactions that are subjected to a lot of, uh, that, that entails a lot of subjectivity, then how might that uh, impact the financial statements? Especially if the client is one that's a publicly held client. They're followed closely by analysts. There's a lot of pressure on the management to meet uh, analyst numbers. Well, you put those, those factors together with the fact that the client has a more complex accounting structure leads to higher, possibly leads to higher inherent risk. Right? So we use the information about uh, the client's business risk environment to, to get a better understanding of, and to be able to better assess inherent risk as well as control risk. Then we talked about uh, once the auditor gathers this information, understanding the entity, um, and they have to make a decision about whether or not they want to accept the client or continue if this is an older, uh, an existing client. So once they decide that they're going to accept the client or continue with the client, they uh, contract the audit. We talked about the engagement letter, which is also covered in Chapter 3. Uh, and the engagement letter is essentially a contract between the auditor and the client and lays out what the auditor's responsibilities are and what the client's responsibilities are, recognizing that the financial statements are the responsibility of management, and management has to make assertions about the information contained in those financial statements. And the auditor is going to gather evidence to test those assertions and deliver an opinion on the uh, financial statements. Uh, last week, a uh, couple weeks ago, we talked about getting an understanding of the internal control structure. And the importance here with respect to uh, planning the overall audit is internal controls risk assessment is an important component of what? The risk assessment related to internal controls is an important component because it helps the auditor determine what? Risk, risk of material mistake. Right? So it's an important component of the audit risk model. Um, because the auditor is going to provide an opinion on whether or not the financial statements are free of material statements. So it's important uh, for auditors to be able to assess this. And the, uh, what's the other reason that the auditors assess control risk? What does it help them determine? To understand if their auditors get higher or low. Well, their audit risk is independent of that, right? But you know, I think. Inherit risk? Well, inherit risk is the client's risk, right? The auditor just assessed it. You're on the right track. So they, they, let's say they set the audit risk low, and then they determine that the material mistaken is high. How does that, what does that affect? They want to keep their audit risk low. So they have to investigate a little bit more and do this. Right, and we call that detection risk, right? So that's important for the auditor to be able to determine the nature, timing, and extent of their audit procedures. Right? So that is, that's going to affect their detection risk. We talked about the fact that the way that the auditors gather information about the effectiveness of internal controls, because remember, this is in the planning stage. Right? So the way that they gather this is they will document their understanding, control charts, questionnaires, narratives, talking to uh, management, their understanding if it's a continuing client based on prior work. Um, they also have to assess for risk um, if, uh, because that increases, if, when you're thinking about fraud, right, think about uh, the fraud risk triangle. Incentives, pressures, opportunities, 
and uh, attitudes and rationalizations, right? So a poor internal control environment creates greater opportunity for fraud. Please. 
decision about other times? What do you think they thought? Why isn't it deep? Because I've been going on and on and on about, oh, shipping, shipping, shipping. Why is it not deep? There's different shipping terms. Yep. Different shipping terms, right? So this doesn't tell you enough, right? The D doesn't tell you enough because it could be shipping point, uh, you know, shipping when delivered. So uh, ownership transfers when the goods are delivered to the uh, customer. This doesn't tell you enough. So that's, but this is the uh, overall, um, and if this fee covers all types of revenue transactions, so the answer, you're right, is the fee. All right. So in the revenue cycle, we have, so the way we're going to approach this, and the way auditors approach it, the auditors, they break the audit down into business cycles. And then within those business cycles, they identify the major functions of those cycles in, in that business cycle, and then look at the control around those functions. Um, and obviously some functions are going to be more risky than other functions. Right? And the auditor adjusts their, their approach based on the risk that they assign. So the major functions in the revenue cycle, uh, and I'm going to assume, right, when I talk about the revenue cycle, I tend to talk about uh, a company that uh, ships, right, that they ship goods to the customer versus a service company. So in the major functions, you have the order entry function. And the order entry function deals with the point that the order is initiated. So that if a customer calls in or sends in an uh, order, it goes to the order entry, the order entry person will review that order. Right. So what are some of the things that you think the order entry person should be looking for that are important before processing an order? What kind of information? Yes. Whether the client is credit worthy? Well, that's the credit authorization. Like what type of something they want in the Right, so they might check is inventory available? What else? Think about the assertion, the occurrence assertion. The occurrence assertion is that Transactions that are reported in the sales journal are valid transactions. They've occurred and they've been made to non-fictitious customers. What are you saying? Right. Is it a customer? Right. So that person wants to check to make sure, the order entry clerk wants to check and make sure that that customer appears in our customer master file. There has to be controls over the customer master, the customer master file. Because you don't want people to just add to the customer master file, fictitious customer. Right. <coughs> now, is that important? Now, we all order on Amazon. And I'm sure the first time you order on Amazon, you're not a customer on Amazon's customer master file. Why is it not important to check the customer master file if you're ordering uh, online at a place like Amazon? Or you go into a retail store for the first time and buy something. Why is it less important? Why will they make you this? You're physically doing it yourself. You're not having another. It's not on paper. You're physically going to a store. You're physically putting in your credit card information. There you go. Credit card. It's cash. Right? You, you, you're ordering with cash. Because a credit card is cash. For the most part, I mean, it's not. It, it, that's how business treats. The business treats if they don't have an account for a credit card, they have cash, and that any sale that they made is paid with a credit card is going to be considered a cash payment, right? So that's a different. Like you, you're, you're, um, when you order online, right? Because Amazon, you're not going face to face. But when you order online, you're not getting those goods are shipping after the fact, right? After you've paid. So, and they verified that that credit card belongs to you. Um, you know, they rely on controls that credit card companies have, right? Um, so that, you're, the goods are gonna go, they're gonna be paid before those goods go. They have a ship. I mean, they have a credit card number. So the risk of goods going to an unauthorized customer is, le there's less risk to them 
because they've got to pay. There's a, a transaction that occurred. Yes? Sorry, well, um, should should have after a Right, that's what I'm saying. But for some something like Amazon, right? They're paying, so they're not in, well, they're not losing it. But Uh, the accounts receivable 
subledger maintained that to ensure that the accounts receiving from the general ledger uh, subledger is updated appropriately uh, for transactions that occur, such as ship selling goods to customers and collecting cash, and then to uh, update the general ledger. So you expect to see that there's a reconciliation between the accounts receivable the subledger and the general ledger on a timely basis. So those are the major functions. Um, some of the files and reports that auditors might use in the process of auditing uh, sales and collection account would be things like the pending order master file. And what that is is any outstanding orders that have not been filled. And the importance of that is that um, the auditor would want to look at that to determine that you know if you have a significant amount of outstanding orders that have not been filled, it, that might tell you something about inventory, right? That there, there are inventory shortages. They're not, uh, and most companies do try to manage their inventory. So is there a problem with inventory obsolescence or you know, that because inventory doesn't seem to be available to meet the demand? Uh, or is there a breakdown in, term, in controls in that they're not, uh, that when they fill the order, they're not updating the pending, pending order master file. Um, so uh, you want to use that to see what kind of controls might be problematic. Credit checks, approval files, right, because you want evidence. So it's not enough to just say that you have credit authorization. You want to see that there are the credit authorization is being done. Um, and you want to see that any exceptions, power exceptions happen. So for example, if a customer is exceeded, their uh, credit limit and they're allowed to still place an order uh, and receive the goods, uh, that should be approved. Right? It should be approved by somebody uh, with the authority to do so. So you want to see that. Priceless master file is the, obviously the price file that um, the company has that uh, guides what prices they charge their customers. And so remember, one of the assertions is accuracy. Do you want that the prices match uh, the prices that customers are charged uh, agree to the customer uh, price list master file. The sales journal, extremely important. Yes, case. Um, so when, when, a, when a manager will uh, approve <coughs> the, um, the credit to, to, to a customer, it's like the family has overriding the customer. Right. So, and so that's the business decision. Right? So it's not that what you would want to see in that case is that there are procedures in place for approval. So the credit manager, so what you see most times is that the company will say, okay, we will allow some uh, situ some flexibility that for customers uh, that have exceeded their credit limit uh, will allow a shipment. And they might cap it at a certain amount. Um, and anything, oh, and, then, and a control might be that it has to be a, approved by a senior level person before it happens, right? Um, and so that's what you want to see. Because companies might have, their, they might have a good business reason to allow that customer to still order, right? And so you don't want to control so stringent that um, it negatively impacts the company's ability, um, their business. But you want to see that they they have controls in place to deal with those exceptions, and so you would look for approvals. So that would not be handling any efficiency. No, not if the company not if the company doesn't have any um, controls in place around it or any guidelines around it, then that's a control, right? You violated uh, you violated a control, and so that would be seen as. So uh, you know, the sales journal uh, used the, the again we're using the sales journal to that's the where revenue was captured and reported. So we test the currents around this completeness using the sales journal. Uh, so uh, that's an important uh, journal that in this cycle that's used. Uh, the sales analysis report is really uh, might be used mostly in performing analytical procedures. Right, because really what the sales analysis report is, it's a detailed breakdown of sales, perhaps by uh, product line, by division, by sales person, 
you know, uh, so it's just a detailed analysis of the report of, of the sales, uh, because your sales journal is going to include information about sales, right? The, uh, the, when the sale occurred, the amount of the sale, who the sale was made to, uh, what the product was. But if you want to analyze trends, um, by pro uh, or you want to drill down to a much more detailed level, that's where a sales analysis report is useful. Um, and then the other reports are, as, as they said, accounts receivable, age, compounds, you know, that's important to be able to identify uh, the age of accounts receivable that's used to determine the allowance without the accounts. The cash receipts listing is basically the cash receipts journal. Uh, and customer statements are the statements that the company sends out on a monthly basis to customers. So those are just some of the, it's not, and a lot of it's going to be driven by the, the client's uh, system of um, their accounting education system, the type of business they have. But these are just some general reports and files that you can see auditing this, this site. So back to your favorite topic, assertions. So when we talked about assertions a few weeks ago, I said the assertions don't pay. It doesn't matter what cycle you're in, uh, what account you're looking at, the assertions are going to be the same. It's just the evidence and the documents that you look at, the uh, files that we use to gather evidence about those assertions. So when we, for example, when we talk about occurrence, and I've used this one as an example, occurrence basically said that the sales that are reported in the sales journal, they're real. Right, they're valid, they're made to non fictitious customers. So the control that an auditor is going to look for is to ensure that, for example, that a sale is, that a sales are matched to uh, a shipping document. That the shipping document is the document that uh, supports a sale being reported in the sales journal. Right, so you're gonna look to make sure that they match the date the amount, the, the, the customer, the, the product. So you're going to make sure. So that's the control. Right? That the client would have the control that all sales have to have this, uh, this corresponding shipping document. And so when the auditor tests this uh, control, they're going to select a sample from the sales journal and make sure that those that is supported by shipping documents. Whereas with completeness, we're going to select a sample because the completeness is that everything that should be reported has been reported, right? And again, it's the same two documents, the same uh, file and the same document. But the auditor's objective is to test that uh, it's complete, that the sales journal, one, that it's valid, the transactions in there, and that it's complete, that it reports all valid transactions. Right, so the auditor's test uses the same document with, with different objectives. They're testing different objectives. Any questions on that? So uh, accuracy. So also, when we're testing assertions, right, we could, in some instances, we can use the same, so for example, uh, we could use the same sample. We select a sample, let's say we're testing occurrence again, so we're going to select a sample of sales transactions from the sales journal, sales journal, and we're going to tie those transactions to the shipping document. Well, when we do that, we can also test accuracy, right? Because all of these documentations, that's a, that, that transaction should be supported by the appropriate documentation. So we could check, okay, for that sale, is there an approved, uh, uh, customer order. Was that customer order, was the customer, uh, before the, the transaction occurred or was reported or initiated, was there proper credit approval? So we could go, so for that same sample that we pulled to test occurrence, we can also check credit authorization, so we're testing accuracy. We're, uh, we can also test whether or not the, the prices are correct. Right, so we could check to make sure that uh, it, it matches the price master file. We 
we could check to see uh, is it classified, I'm sorry, is it reported in the right period? Because we'll look at the shipping document and it's to check as to whether or not it was the, the item was shipped before 1231. So we can perform, uh, select that sample to perform these tests. So what our concern is, again, is to ensure that we gather evidence to test these assertions that management's making about uh, revenue. So what you'll notice, and we're going to go over problems on Thursday dealing with this, is oftentimes when we're testing controls, assuming that we're going to rely on the controls, we're also there's certain tests that we can perform that will also be considered a test of a substantive test of transactions. So when we're testing controls, we're testing attributes. So an attribute, for example, for sales, as I said, would be that sales in the sales journal are supported by a shipping document. So uh, sales are reported in the right period. So those are attributes. But that also, by testing those attributes, that also gives us information about the account balance because we're pulling information from the sales journal. Right? We can also we can check the prices that they agree to the price. Uh, to the, to the price master file. And so the, when we have when we have a test that allows us to not only test an attribute related to controls, but also provides us with information about the account balance, it gives us uh, 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 transaction information, financial information, that's called a dual purpose test. And because it gives us information about the transaction as well as information about the controls over that transaction. So that's a dual purpose test. So oftentimes, the test of transactions and the test of controls will occur simultaneously. And we call those dual purpose tests. We also have some standard tests of account balances. And those will be tests of things like accounts receivable, the cash account, uh, related to uh, the sales and collection side. And so if you remember the ASB assertions, when we're talking about assertions about account balances, we're talking about things such as existence, completeness, rights and obligations, valuation and allocation, um, accuracy. So for accounts, for, for the sales and collection cycle, the major account that we're going to look at on the balance sheet is accounts receivable. And so what our concern is for the concern is for the account receivable is that it exists. And so the audit procedure that an auditor would use is to look at, uh, to confirm the account balance that with the, with the customer. So to select a sample of accounts receivable and confirm those receivable balances with the customer uh, and, uh, and perform follow-up procedures as necessary. Talk about what those procedures are. And the other key thing that you want to identify um, obviously, you want to make sure that it's complete and accurate. But related to accounts receivable, remember, accounts receivable has to be reported at its net realizable value. So that means that we have to examine the allowance without the accounts and determine the adequacy of the allowance without the accounts, and that deals with valuation. Is the account with us. so a procedure would be think about if you're testing the amounts of that account, we need, we need to look at the age trial balance. Right? Because what our, what we want to determine is obviously are they aging the account receivable correctly, but also the percentages that they're applying, the reasonableness of the percentages that they're applying to the various buckets and account receivable. Uh, so we would look at that. We would also look at audits, we also look at the right. Does it make sense from year one to year two as a percentage of sales and so forth? The other um, uh, unique um, assertion for this would be rights and obligations. Right? Does not have the client factored any receivables? In other words, did they sell their accounts receivable? So you're not going to be able to 
just because you confirm the accounts receivable, does that the accounts receivable exist, does not mean that the client still has rights to that receivable. Right? Because when a company sells their accounts receivable, it's the customers oblivious. They're gonna just, they owe, they, they contracted with you, they owe you the money, when they pay, they're gonna pay you. That does so, just confirming does not tell you anything about the, the whether or not the company still owns the receivable. So that's, so for determining whether or not the company factored any receivables or sold any receivables, you're gonna have to look at documentation, contracts, the board of directors minutes, for example, talk to management um, to determine whether or not receivables is in pledge or factor. So those are the three key points related to account receivable. So what, how does the credit approval tell you that the transaction happened? That is a valid transaction. By, by, by uh, approving the credit, how do you know that that's a valid transaction? Right. You don't really know. Occurrence is, the, that, that's not the objective of approving credit. Because what, what makes the, the control over related to occurrence deals with the fact that a transaction is a valid transaction, right? That there is a shipping document to support that transaction. So let's talk about the, what is completeness tell you? All the transactions that are. That all transactions that should be reported have been reported. So how, what is it about the credit check that satisfies that assertion?
that doesn't deal with the cutoff. Is when it, it's it's a credit approval. They said someone is physically authorizing that transaction, uh, that it, uh, or said it's checking to ensure that the customer has the appropriate credit for that transaction. Just to tie it to the price list that that customer is being charged uh, the prices that based on the price. Like, um, if they do like timing on like when they approve the credit check, does that tie to cut off? No? Cut off only deals if the transaction is reported in the right period. That the transaction is reported. So that's dealing with when the trans. So what you're talking about is it are a control deficiency would be um, if the credit is approved after the shipment. Well, then that's a control deficiency. It's not about timing. It's a deficiency because they should not, the credit should occur prior to the shipment. All right. Yes. So can it be accuracy because um, some people flip the big force credit will generally have higher interest rate than credit. So like when your equipment says I'll sell credit by the US like based on their based on their credit it to um, accurately approve their interest. No. Because right, that's a different account, right? We're talking about now you're talking about an account balance, all right? So because if you if you're charging the customer interest, you're gonna, that's gonna show up in interest income. Right? Not in revenue. <coughs> so it's accuracy, it's accuracy because uh, just similar to you a customer uh, has to have credit before you can uh, approve the you know, ship, or you have to have some evidence that they have credit. The the prices that you, you charge the customer has to agree to the prices in a master file. So that's it, it deals with the accuracy of processing that transaction. So we're talking about the, the right? And the, 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 the timing, so again, it's kind of a good point. Uh, good question, the timing, if that, if you find, if I'm wrap, uh, looking at a sample of invoices to see that they uh, contain proper credit approval, right, and I find that the credit, I'm looking at the invoice, and the invoice is dated you know, December 1st, and I see that the credit manager signed off on the, on the invoice on December 10th, well, the control fail. The control failed because you're not invoicing your customer before you ship them goods. Not certainly not that far in advance. So the control failed. It's not. It's a control failure. It has nothing to do with cut off. All right. So that answer is accuracy. disclose 
that they have this factoring arrangement or they sold the receivables. Because what happens when you factor or sell your receivables is that you are basically getting financing, right? And you're using that money for operations or whatever. But you still have a commitment to the lender to collect on those receivables. You still, so you're, remember what I said, the customer is oblivious to whether or not you sold the receivables. So you have to collect on it. If, you, if that receivable doesn't exist, then now you you are you still owe but you still owe money for that. Right? That impacts your debt, your ability to pay back the debt. Because and it's also the cost when you sold it, the lender purchased some a bundle of receivables that they expect to be paid for. And so you're still obligated to collect on those receivables. And when you collect those receivables, you remit the payment to the lender and to pay down your the money you borrowed. So existence is important. So it, it's all, so the focus, the emphasis is gonna be on existence because just because you sold it does not alleviate you of the responsibility of collecting on those receivables. Make sense? So the answer is existence. Okay, so let's wrap this up. Uh, key steps. Let's recap. Identify the client business risk, study the client's industry and external environment, and then uh, evaluate management's objectives, their business processes, and so forth. This is chapter three, okay? Again, we're gonna use this information as we try to determine how that business risk in, will manifest in the financial statements. How does that, again, think about analytical procedures. It's attention directed, where's the risk? Said that chapter four said uh, tolerable misstatement, materiality, set the materiality limit, and assess inherent risk. Things we're going to consider related to this cycle is in terms of the significant accounts in the red room collection cycle, the uh, balance sheet accounts, is going to be accounts receivable. Right? So when we are allocating materiality, remember the uh, Quantitative or planning materiality is based on some percentage of a component of either net income, uh, revenue, whatever the auditor decides, the judgment the auditor use. So if they take 2% of revenue, that's called planning materiality, and that number is allocated to different accounts in the balance sheet. And for the revenue cycle, it's going the most significant account is going to be allocated to would be accounts receivable. Okay. And so we have to consider the importance of accounts receivable, the riskiness of accounts receivable. And so, what, for example, if we consider uh, the risk related to accounts receivable for a client, we look at that client's business. So let's say you have a client, uh, you have client A, and client A a lot of small uh, accounts receivable balances under $25,000. Right? A lot of small customers. And then you have client B, and client B has a lot of major customers. Most of their accounts receivable balances are $500,000 or so, around that number. So, but they have a few customers, but they're big customers. What, what client is more risky? So Casey says they want the big customers. So what, you know, uh, 
is you can't say just based on, you know, you, you would look at that. Well, what's the impact? What's the likelihood that we can do that? You know, do they have a particular product that's very specific and they have a patent on it? So, you know, so those are the things you look at in assessing and the point of that, right, is because you have to assess the ability of their customers to pay because you have to think about the situation, okay, right, the, uh, the ability to collect on receivables. You also want to consider the risk of fraud with respect, with respect to revenue recognition. What does the standard say about revenue in terms of risk? Inherently high risk. You can you assume the auditor should assume that revenue is inherently high risk. And so you have to adjust your audit. So when you look at and assess fraud risk and revenue, you assess it with that lens. And then you look at the uh, what types of controls they have in place, what's management's positions or that the, the culture um, that the company operates in and, and any of those things mitigate the risk of fraud. Are there, if, if there are higher opportunities, then because controls are lies, that increases the risk even more. So with inherent risk, uh, things that auditors are going to consider would be industry-related factors. I talked about this before, the complexity and the contentiousness of the revenue recognition issues. So revenue recognition, when you're talking about companies that ship goods to customers, that's kind of simple. That's a, that's a simple process, right? Did I ship the goods? Yes. Did I not? No. So if I ship them, I can call report revenue. If I didn't, then I, I shouldn't record revenue. It's pretty, you know, yes or no, black and white. And there can be other issues with it, but the process is simple. It's a simple process, uh, counter process. But if you have revenue, that's uh, determined based on uh, performance, uh, that you have to meet certain criteria before that you can report that revenue, before you consider, can consider that revenue is earned, then that is a more difficult process, especially if determination of when the revenue is earned is not very clear. So again, that's gonna in increase uh, the risk. The difficulty of the transactions, and if, the, if, if you if there's been uh, material misstatements in past audits. Uh, so some of the things we talk about, uh, think through, or consider, or seeing when we talk about inherent risk in the revenue cycle would be things like improper revenue recognition. And that's where, uh, for example, revenues that lack economic substance. So bill and hold, channel stuff. So if you think about these two examples, bill and hold, is if you uh, bill your customer, you've reported revenue, but you haven't shipped it. So is that a real transaction? Because it hasn't shipped. The customer hasn't taken possession of it. That should be a red flag, that type of transaction. That's not a normal transaction. Right? It could be a way that a company is trying to boost their revenue. Uh, channel stuffing is when you just ship all of these goods out to the customer and the customer has no intention of paying. It doesn't matter, it's not a true transaction or it, it doesn't involve any uh, economic substance, right? And you, you, this is a scheme that companies will engage in uh, to, because if you think about it, a year end, you're shipping out all of these goods towards the, in the, in the final quarter year, you're shipping all these goods, you're shipping to the customers. Everybody's busy around the red. Companies are closing, they're busy. So those goods go out and it takes, you recorded the revenue. The auditor then comes in and they look and they're like, oh yeah, good ship. Right? A valid sale, they test the currents, they test the completeness, it's valid. The other thing the auditor should look at, because remember I talked about doing this uh, sales analysis, well, if you see a spike in your revenue account in the last quarter, the last week of the month, that might be a red flag. Why is it that sales have gone up by 20% in one month? What, you know, is there a business reason for that? Yeah, then you would want to look at, you should look at returns and allowances because you should, because if a company
customer did not order those goods, they're returning those goods. So you would see a corresponding spike in sales returns in subsequent months. So those are things, you know, that uh, ways to try to, to identify that or red flags that suggest that a, cu a customer, a client has engaged in channel stuffing. Uh, you also want to determine whether or not revenue uh, lack a uh, reasonable arm's length process. Right? So that is engaging in sales to affiliated parties, related parties. Okay. What do you know and what happens with uh, transactions that occur between related parties? How do how they dealt with the financial statements? Don't they get ignored until they reach a third party? No, not ignored. What's the word? Eliminated in consolidation, right? If you have affiliated, if you if you're consolidated, or or you identify related party transactions, you have to eliminate that transaction from uh, uh, your sales numbers, right? Because that's not an arm's length transaction. Because if that was the case, companies would just sell to their affiliates and boost their revenue anytime they want, it, right? So those are the limits. So you want to look for those types of transactions. Uh, ensure that they're eliminated in um, consolidation or that there's controls in place to make sure that those, and also those types of transactions should not be reported in the revenue account. There should be a separate account for that, right? It should not be reported in the same account as uh, revenue made to third parties, customers, and so forth, trading, trading students. Another thing is uh, reporting revenue on receipts from non-revenue producing transactions. So for example, if a company gets a credit or in, a, in an example where uh, the company charges interest to customers, that should not go in the revenue, that's not revenue. Those should be in other income, so not reflected in the revenue account. Uh, or reporting revenue from transactions that are real transactions, but at inflated amount. So inappropriate revenue recognition. And this you might see if a company has a non, uh, 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 an environment where their their revenue is generated based on performance of some type of service, and so they might recognize. Uh, so, for example, if you are a company and you you sell subscriptions, right, the way to magazines or whatever, right? The way that that revenue that, that revenue should be reported based on the percentage of those. Uh, subscriptions you earn in the current year. Everything else should be, so if I pay up front, the customer pays up front, um, let's say they pay up front in, in July, July 1st, right? I can only, the company should only recognize as of December 31st, 50% of that subscription. The remaining amount remains in deferred revenue to liability because I haven't performed the service. So if a company recognizes the entire amount, they've inflated revenue to appropriately. Not that it's not a valid transaction, it's just that revenue is inflated. And then finally, uh, things related to shipping cutoff, that's why we look at uh, auditors who attest this to ensure that they're reporting it in the right period by looking at a sample of shipments before and after your rent and ensuring that those transactions are reported appropriately. Um, I talked about returns and allowances already, that is the red flag if you're seeing an unusual amount of returns and allowances, it could be because the company have engaged in channel stuff and, and then your collectability of accounts receivables are always um, inherently risky just because of the valuation um, that that is a subjective estimate. So one more knowledge check and then we'll
that uh, it's approved by someone who's a response, not just by the credit department, but it should be reviewed, uh, I'm sorry, reviewed and approved by someone other than the credit department. And you're, before you can approve something, you should have appropriate documentation to support it. What B is saying is that write offs should be supported by an agent schedule um, showing that receivables over to have been written off. But there's, first of all, that doesn't provide, just because it's on an agent schedule doesn't mean that it should be written off. Right? Before a company writes something off, they probably have, sh there will be evidence to support that uh, the client, they will come to a conclusion that there's no way that that customer is going to pay. Either they write it off or they turn it over to a collection agency or whatever. But it, you want it to be, a, you don't want to just write off something based on an agent. Analysis. And, it, and the agent analysis could be wrong, right? So you want to see that there's approval and documentation to support it before you write it So the correct answer is A. Okay, so um, if you haven't read chapter, this chapter, make sure you read it prior to class on Thursday.